So it's 5.33, and I think we should probably get going if everybody is ready. Um, and I will begin by introducing myself. My name is David Lewis. I'm the Dean of the School of Constructed Environments. Um, and on behalf of uh, the Tishman Environment and Design Center, which Joel Towers is here represented, uh, nodding and waving, uh, and the School of Constructed Environments, I'm very pleased to be able to uh, welcome you all. It's great to see this number of people in a program called Street Futures, how COVID-19 has changed our streetscapes. Um, and the task tonight is relatively simple, um, which is we're going to look at something that seems on one hand very straightforward, namely what happens to parking spaces. What I mean by this is that we have, you know, two, point, two years into the pandemic, how has our concept of the public street changed? Um, particularly in the light of recent news about changes in the way in which we're cleaning our streets and uh, reworking our streets, what, what, is the, what is the role that should be played from a public standpoint of uh, this really vital space? Vital space that for many years was thought of as being the primary parlance of of, of automobiles or parking, but over the last two years has been really the repository for a new understanding of health, of public access, of equity, of uh, when businesses, particularly restaurants and other businesses needed the outdoor air to meet not only requirements, but also our understandings of what it means to live in a vibrant city. Question, one of the questions we wanna to raise tonight is what's the role of design? in relationship to questions of, of, of public space and changing nature of the definition of the street. Now, the designs for many of these conversions that were in many ways temporary were sometimes prosaic, put together to meet code requirements, safety requirements, but also ones to increasingly meet challenges of weather. What does it mean to live outdoors while at the same time having questions of fresh air? Uh, as you see on the right, it meets the requirements, but is, is not exactly something led by design. On the other hand, there are projects that are much more aggressively led by issues of design, fully in challenging the very question of what, what is something that is temporary? What is permanence? And what is its value, particularly in the tissue of the street? These spaces have become rethinking the way in which communities work, both with positive attributes as well as tensions. And so, the hope tonight is to really engage these full range, range of questions uh, at Parsons, using Parsons as a essentially a, a platform or a territory for a conversation between different aspects of the city, both designers, those working for the city, working as public advocates for questions of urban space, to really open up this very question, how do we learn from the last two years? Where do we go forward? What is the role of the design? How do we think about the future? of our streets. I'm gonna frame this also in the context of Parsons, which interestingly enough, through a project called Street Seats, has been doing a number of conversions of parking spaces under a, uh, under a program to redesign this for a temporary standpoint. And this is a course in which students design, build, fabricate um, public spaces, in this case, on the corner of 13th and 5th Avenue, using timber using recycled materials to create a temporary public spaces for seating. They've used cardboard to be able to reconfigure what the nature of space is, as well as to use bamboo, unusual materials that really get at the question of are the material circularity of materials in a temporary environment. Um, and this is project that's ongoing. We're looking at having a, a street seats, uh, a new street seat primarily out of cork this year being put in place at the same location and, and really continuing that tradition at Parsons of advocacy engagement in the intersection of academia and public space. We have four speakers today. And so the format will be each of us been asked to present um, a relatively brief but focused question about how does one approach these questions? Um, and I will begin by introducing each of them um, and then have, uh, turn it over to them to to give a, a, a sort of introduction from their perspective. We'll, at that point, we'll then open this to a kind of conversation between us with a with moderated discussion with a series of posed questions 
and then turn it over to the broader audience questions that you can either put into the chat or you can use the raise hand function to be able to open up when we go into that open forum. Um, so we have four really great speakers tonight. I'm super thrilled that they're all here. I will begin with Emily Weidenhoff, who is the Director of Public Space of the New York City Department of Transportation. Um, Emily has worked at the DOT since 2010 and comes to this presentation with an in-depth understanding of the complexity of the subject. She received a graduate degree from Columbia in architecture and urban design and has taught extensively at GSAP. Um, please join with me in joining and welcoming Emily to Parsons. Thank you so much, David. Uh, very cool. So uh, my team and I at DOT are primarily uh, charged with thinking about our streets as public space. And over the course of the pandemic, um, New Yorkers embraced our streets as public space like never before. Um, space for, uh, for outdoor dining and restaurants, but also through our open streets program, um, space um, and street space for really prioritizing pedestrians and cyclists, um, for using our streets uh, for economic recovery and development, for building community and relationships. Um, we've had multiple weddings at, um, at some of our open streets and we have heard countless stories of neighbor, neighbors uh, meeting for the first time um, on, uh, during the pandemic um, on their open streets. Um, using our streets to promote arts and culture uh, as well as supporting schools and healthy lifestyles. And Open Streets um, now in its third season has contributed um, to a massive citywide relief uh, that was ultimately really held up by a citizen agency, by neighborhoods um, wanting to use their streets uh, for a whole host of different ways. Um, and the, the same with, with open restaurants and all of the different uh, iterations of, of outdoor dining and, and public space over the course of the pandemic also um, uh, was a huge, huge, um, driver in moving beyond um, pandemic response and into recovery for the city. Yet at the same time, I'm sure um, you have all seen uh, the kind of underutilization even of these wonderful new ways of using our streets. And the pandemic for us certainly have only heightened uh, the, the intense value of our streets and how we need to be thinking about how best to um, continue to, to derive value and make sure that streets are always serving um, a, a wide majority of user. And so for us, the pandemic in many ways um, really kind of uh, reiterated um, and, and galvanized the need to think kind of beyond the binary of a street is either open or closed and really think about um, a, a design gradient, think about the hardware, the hardscape of our design as being um, very, very flexible uh, in a way that will allow us to kind of constantly um, be managing for the evolving uses and the kind of software of our streets. And again, that's everything from, um, uh, from our bike sharing and, and EV charging stations um, to all different kind of, of, of mode share and micro mobility um, down to restaurants and other types of ways to use our public space. But even beyond the design, um, we think that it's incredibly important um, to be thinking about the design of our streets and the design of our public realm um, really in a robust feedback loop to ultimately amplify the inputs of, of participation, kind of starting with community partnership and then working our way through a series of, of programs that allow um, a whole range of, um, of public users to engage with their streets and ultimately shape um, and keep these spaces relevant. So open streets as being really our first um, our first um, kind of gateway and entry into uh, communities beginning a dialogue and a discourse about what they want to see with their streets. Uh, and then thinking about all the other um, 
ways we can, even in, in small ways for seating, for bicycle parking, also um, as that, that curb lane space as a, as a civic welcome mat, as an extension of a library or community center um, or senior center, but really allow um, communities to participate and shape the space of their streets to maximize its value. Um, and then ultimately, um, using um, more sophisticated tools like shared streets, which allow us to prioritize uh, streets for pedestrians and cyclists um, while enforcing slow speeds and also continuing to, um, to manage them sometimes for, for events. And then ultimately continuing to think about more space for people, for plazas, uh, for carving out that space. And ultimately all the other pieces that we need in this feedback loop to stand up these vibrant public spaces, especially in an equitable way. And so driving um, resources to areas that need it most. So neighborhoods across New York City all have access to vibrant, safe and accessible public spaces. And not just in terms of keeping these spaces beautiful and clean, but also really thinking about how economic layers um, like concessions can deliver vibrant uh, public spaces in, um, in neighborhoods across the city while also helping small business uh, and how programming is a way, again, to extend the, the civic life and um, cultural creativity of neighborhoods out into their streets and, and thinking about that as a planning tool and at thinking about all of this energy and excitement um, as really beginning to build larger scale uh, streetscapes at the corridor and at the neighborhood scale. And um, you know, with that, we're just finding kind of continuous uh, new uh, environments and, and ecosystems and ways to engage with communities to really reshape our streets. Um, 34th Avenue and Jackson Heights being um, one of our most exciting projects on deck uh, coming uh, in, in the coming months where we have an amazing um, uh, density of schools and really thinking about um, building on the bicycle and pedestrian priority corridor over the course of the pandemic and starting to really use um, uh, streets as public space for more events and programming and for uh, ways to um, for kids and teachers and parents to get to and from school as um, the kind of backbone of, of reimagining uh, this important corridor, ultimately all uh, to make sure that our streets, again, continue to stay relevant and thriving, um, really promoting um, uh, community, culture, and, and commerce on our streets. This is, this is when we should ask everyone to turn on the mics and applause for an incredibly condensed but really very loaded presentation. Um, uh, Emily, thank you very, very much for the succinct nature of that, but also the kind of complexity that you're talking about in the relationship of public, of, of running the kind of challenges of change and transformation. Before I introduce the next speaker, I was amiss for not uh, thanking and extending appreciation to Mike, Mike Harrington for all the work that he's done at uh, the Tishman Center, um, without which we really want to be able to make this uh, program happen tonight. The, the second speaker is uh, Fazia Kanane, uh, who holds a double role as the founder of Studio Four, a design studio with residential and commercial projects from New York to Hong Kong. She is also the vice president of a consortium called Design Advocates, which offers a completely new model for what it means to do an engaged practice. Uh, Fazia holds graduate degree from UC Berkeley, and I will note, engaged the pre-architecture studies at Parsons um, a couple of years ago. Uh, so I'm really pleased to be able to not just welcome, but welcome back uh, Fazia to uh, the Parsons space and look forward to your presentation. Thanks so much, David and Joel for having me today. Um, just gonna share screen. Um, so as David mentioned, I am on the board of Design Advocates, um, which is mostly what I'm going to talk about today because we've been doing a lot of work related to open restaurants and open streets since our inception, which was um, 
probably about a month after the pandemic, there were a group of us um, who run small firms here in the city and we started meeting once a week and um, we're sort of like, what's gonna happen to our firms for one, but two, none of us are health professionals. So how can we help in the pandemic? Um, and we all felt a little helpless in the beginning, but then slowly realized that there were certainly going to be space implications, whether it was interior space or public space. Um, there were there were going to be effects from COVID and that perhaps we could use our skills, um, our design skills to, to help um, kind of mitigate those changes. Um, so basically Design Advocates is a platform for architects and designers to share resources and collaborate on efforts to serve the public through pro bono projects. We do research, we do advocacy. We're mostly exploring how creatives can work together to do public good and work with communities in a sustainable, inclusive and equitable way through collaboration, resource sharing, partnerships and research. Um, as I said, most of our projects in the beginning were directly related to COVID. Um, a lot of them had to do with open restaurants and trying to help small businesses kind of keep afloat by um, setting up seating on the sidewalks and then ultimately in the street and parking spaces. Um, some other projects that we've worked on uh, since then are um, designing some education and social pavilions for a transitional um, housing center in the Bronx for women who are formerly homeless um, with children under the age of the ten, under the age of 10. Um, We've also been trying to advocate for better education, more inclusive and just education. And so we just finished up writing the summer curriculum for um, a CUNY city tech program that'll be happening this summer. Um, so our reach in a short time has become far and wide. Um, and today I specifically wanna talk about um, our open streets program uh, that we did in Elmhurst. and. Um, I'm sure everyone is familiar with open streets at this point, um, but really it, it is a program that, and Emily can probably comment on this, but um, it's a program that's meant to increase open air public space for safe gathering. And it, it was started during the pandemic for that exact reason. And so we also realized that it became a way for neighborhoods to kind of recover and revitalize um, as we came out of the height of the pandemic. Um, so our team really started to look at where open streets could be designated in the city where they hadn't been was where we started. And we learned that there was a direct correlation between the median income of a neighborhood and designated open streets. We identified three neighborhoods with the lowest median incomes in the city and confirmed that there were very few, if any, uh, designated open streets there. So we ended up choosing Elmhurst as our case study um, for this project. And, and this started back in 2020, probably the spring of 2020. Um, and we looked at existing data. We looked um, at the actual streets. We did field observations of how the streets were being used. Um, we even went so far as to do traffic analyses with the help of a transportation engineer on our team. Um, and so after we got all of that information and compiled it together, we said we needed to sort of collaborate with the community. And so we got in touch with the Queens Community Board for, um, and with their help and someone from Parks um, who's designated for Elmhurst, uh, we started to do walks of the neighborhood and ultimately identified eight candidate streets um, that we could potentially use for open streets in that neighborhood. Um, and the criteria we kind of used to designate which streets we would uh, classify as open streets were based on foot and car traffic, shade coverage, building density, proximity to businesses, institutions, and community organizations. So ultimately we came up with these eight streets. Um, we made this map and sort of mapped out how these streets related to existing buildings and organizations um, and cultural centers in the neighborhood. And then also started to look at um, whether they would be a play street, a learning street, an events or cultural street. 
Um, and then even going so far as to look at, you know, with the help of the traffic engineer, where, whether it would be most conducive to have it as a full closure, a partial closure, um, and when the streets would be closed. Would it be permanent? Would it be occasionally? Would it be during school hours? Um, and so we basically went through each of these eight streets and did a more in-depth analysis uh, and of what we wanted to propose basically to the community board and the larger community. Um, and so basically provided again, whether it was a full street closure or partial, when it was gonna be used um, and sort of the adjacent, adjacencies to the street. Um, so some of them were close to park spaces already um, or other public spaces. A lot of them are near cultural centers so that when those centers have events, they could sort of open up to the street. Uh, Fazia, um, are, are yeah. you showing uh, something on the screen or there are a couple of good questions in the chat about whether or not there's a map to what you're uh, oh, Are you not seeing my screen? We're seeing, but it's in the, it's located at Design Advocates. Oh. Um, so may, uh, come out of it and then reshare and see yeah, if that works. I mean, sorry, I'm on like slide 12. <laughs> Any better? Not quite yet. It's it says it started sharing the screen, but not yet completed that process. Let me try again. And it, there we go. Yep. Okay. So I'm going to skip ahead to some slides. Okay. So here's the map of all the streets and their adjacencies. Um, Great. And basically, as I said, we designated play streets, learning streets, events, or cultural streets, and then looked at the proximity to um, existing community organizations, cultural centers, and schools. Um, and then basically did a pretty in-depth analysis of each street um, in our proposition, um, which you'll see in the next couple slides. So basically we were able to pro provide really detailed recommendations um, in large part by understanding the existing conditions of each street, um, as well as the street closure viability through our traffic analyses of each street and the surrounding areas. Um, and so we basically put together this transportation analysis report summary, which we submitted um, to DOT, as well as to the police department um, in Elmhurst, as they had a lot of concerns about street closures um, affecting emergency response. Um, and then our final kind of phase of the project was to uh, come together with the community board for and do a community presentation on the open streets that we were proposing. Um, and we, we wanted to get this information out to business owners and the neighbors who lived in, the, in that area and to really see if what we were proposing resonated with their needs because, you know, often it, we design in a bubble or we sort of make recommendations and, and we don't actually hear from the people who are living and working in these areas. And so we thought it was really important to engage them. And so we actually put together uh, a trifold brochure, which you're seeing um, one side of it. So this is the cover and then this is the back side of it. And then this is just kind of describing who we are. And then the map is on the inside. And so the idea was that community members could actually take the map and walk the streets to see if they thought these were um, street closures that would meet their needs. Um, and and I, I believe they applied for a couple of the streets, um, but I haven't had an update in a little while. So um, 
But I'll just close by saying that, you know, this, this started out as kind of a research initiative for design advocates, but was really rooted in an effort to make for more equitable and inclusive public space throughout the city, and especially in neighborhoods that are more often than not overlooked in the process. Thanks. Thank you, Fazia. Um, the, the next presentation is by Martha Snow, um, who is the Associate Director of Programs at the Urban Design Forum. Um, the Urban Design Forum is a key organization in shaping the conversation around the future of New York City and, and I would argue cities globally from their reach and perspective. At, at UDF, Martha is leading work focused on ideas and proposals for envisioning more vibrant and equitable streets. Martha has previously experienced at the Design Trust for Public Space, uh, leveraging her studies at Skidmore to consistently, and this is interesting, to consistently raise focus on our shared resources. Uh, please join with me in welcoming to Parsons, uh, Martha. Awesome. Thanks so much, uh, David and Joel, for having me and, and to Mike for the invitation. Um, I'm just going to share my screen and, and share a little bit about um, just a preview of our work uh, at UDF. All right. So and let me know if my if my slides are working uh, as well. Um, so as David mentioned, my name is Martha Snow. I'm the associate director of programs at the Urban Design Forum, where I lead our Streets Ahead initiative. Um, and I'm excited to share just a little bit about that program uh, with you all today. Uh, let's see. So for those of you who don't know us, um, the Urban Design Forum is an independent membership organization uh, that mobilizes civic leaders to confront defining issues in the built environment. So we empower professionals of diverse backgrounds, industries, and perspectives to shape a better future for all New Yorkers. Uh, and we engage in a range of work, right? So we do government partnerships, we do convenings, we do community design, um, all with our network of interdisciplinary fellows at the center. Um, and I'm really grateful to have gotten to work with Emily and Fosia and Daphne, um, all as part of the forum. Um, Mike and I know, um, David, you're involved as well. So um, really just uh, excited to, um, to convey our work um, as really a group effort of our fellows. So when COVID-19 hit, as we all know, New York City was thrown into crisis mode. And organizationally, we dove into finding ways to support the city in as many ways as we could. Um, so we did that in a couple of ways. Um, this included the Neighborhoods Now program, um, which was a partnership with the Van Allen Institute, uh, which began as a rapid response program that pairs pro bono interdisciplinary design teams with community-based partners in neighborhoods hardest hit by the pandemic. Um, and I know Fosio was involved. Um, David as well. So great to have them um, here to speak to that work as well. Um, but just to, to give a sense of the range of the work, um, projects uh, through Neighborhoods Now addressed pressing neighborhood challenges um, and included things like um, public space redesigns, open restaurant build outs, culture and food night markets, um, and so much more. And that program is still going on today. Uh, we also responded through projects like Care for Hudson Square, um, where we stewarded a design competition to imagine an interactive street installation to reactivate the public realm. Um, and we were thrilled to support WIP Collaborative in realizing restorative ground, uh, which is an amazing and playful installation that explores how street space can serve neurodiverse people in new ways. I mean, it's actually still up in Hudson Square, so I encourage um, folks to go see it. And that's it on the left. Um, so through these projects and more, we saw how our streets across all five boroughs were becoming sites to socialize, dine, play, exercise during the pandemic, as Emily and Fosia have mentioned, um, just so many new uses for our streets. Um, and as the pandemic continued, we also saw the opportunity to put our fellows to work to continue the investigation of what's possible for our streets beyond this crisis. Um, so that is how our Streets Ahead program was born. Uh, we wanted to bring together our fellows to investigate the question, how can we transform streets to build connected communities? Um, and we really wanted to, to investigate both design and policy solutions to get us towards the vision of the streets that we want to see for our city. Um, 
And with a new mayoral administration at a city council, um, new city council taking the helm at the beginning of this year, um, we saw this program as a really great opportunity to both envision what might be possible under the leadership of a visionary two-term mayor. So really thinking, thinking a little longer term, eight years ahead. Um, and then, then also thinking about what could we do tomorrow? You know, what could we do next year um, to really improve our streets? Uh, so we convened interdisciplinary, multi-generational, multi-racial working groups to tackle some key questions about the future of our streets. Um, you can see some of them here um, in some of our convenings uh, last fall. Uh, and we wanted to create space to consider the possibilities for our streets beyond their use as mobility corridors. You know, as Emily and Fosia mentioned, just the ways that our streets are, um, are public spaces now. Um, and how they can serve people and the planet in new ways um, over, uh, over the coming years. So um, we focus on five key lenses, um, commerce, culture, climate, care, and continuity. Um, so they're mostly self-explanatory, but um, just to give a little, a little sense and texture of, of what we explored. So commerce really looked at how streets can um, help to revitalize our city's small business community and support the economic recovery of our city. Um, culture explored how street transformation can support artists and cultural organizations. Um, in climate, we investigated how we can retool street design to confront the impacts of the climate crisis. During Earth Week this week, I'm especially excited to think about some of those questions. Um, in care, we thought about how streets can center safety, care, and healing for New Yorkers of all races, ages, and abilities. Um, and in our continuity group, we, we thought through how we can really build connected, integrated streetscapes. So we, uh, as we do at the forum and all of our programs, we undertook a variety of activities with our fellows to better understand the current landscape and challenges and to come up with new solutions. So we assembled working groups, we interviewed stakeholders, we um, took site visits across New York. Um, I'll just share a few things. We did neighborhood site visits um, all around the city, looking at current conditions and new projects on the street. Um, we talked to cities around the world. So Barcelona, Paris, Medellin, cities that are really thinking big about how we can um, be using and reusing our streetscapes. Um, and we talked to international, uh, national, uh, sorry, local stakeholders as well. Um, so folks in city agencies, um, folks that are working with bids, really people that are engaged in this work every day. Um, and we engaged in some, some great design sprints as well. So again, the real purpose of this program was to, to uh, bring forth visionary thinking about our streets. So um, we uh, brought our design brains to the table um, to consider uh, what might be possible for our streets. Um, and at the forefront of our minds for this program, and I think what, uh, what all of us are considering these days um, for our streets is really how our streets can center equity, accessibility, environmental justice, and safety. Um, so uh, we uh, have been hard at work generating a lot of possibilities and syn synthesizing them into a platform of ideas and a series of illustrations um, that is actually coming soon. So we're looking forward to sharing that publicly in the next two weeks. So please keep an eye out, it's really exciting. Um, but in the meantime, I wanted to just give you a little preview of the types of ideas that we, um, that came forward as part of this work. Um, so, and I, and I, I wanna share these uh, and really I think what our, um, what our platform more than anything is, is meant to serve as a hopeful provocation, right? And a tool to work together to achieve the, the city we want to live in. So some, some of those provocations that I wanted to bring forward to the table and hope we can discuss more today um, include for our commerce group, you know, they thought about things like how can we be testing new last mile delivery solutions to rethink all the ways that um, things like e-commerce are changing our streets. Um, how can we get flexible with our curb usage? How we can, can we design flexible curbs that can serve different um, uses at different times? Um, and how can we think about equitably siting our street space um, to serve uh, street vendors and small businesses? Uh, our culture groups uh, thought about our anchor institutions. So I know Emily mentioned, um, you know, how do uh, um, institutions like libraries use the streets in new ways? Um, and also, how can we be piloting packable arts and culture materials um, to serve artists um, so that they can use the streets even better than they had before for performances, um, exhibitions, things like that? How can we harness new federal investments for our streets? Um, and also, critically, how can we expand the definition of culture in the streets? So beyond just what we typically think of as 
maybe um, a painter or a dancer, but how can we think about culture bearers and culture makers um, as, as um, uh, folks who contribute food, folks who contribute um, literary tradition, storytelling, things like that. So how can we bring that, those new definitions into our streets? Uh, and then climate, again, Earth Week, really excited to think about these things. Um, but we have so much opportunity in our, in our street space um, to be expanding our urban tree canopy even more, to be piloting new nature-based solutions, uh, to be taking every opportunity that we are uh, also um, creating um, new safety infrastructure to also make it green infrastructure, to generate energy in the right of way, um, to expand electrical vehicle charging stations and think about things like low emission zones. Um, cities around the world are, are moving quickly on, on this and, and in New York, we really have an opportunity for that too. Um, and then quickly, last few, um, as I mentioned in Care for Hudson Square, uh, there's really an opportunity for our streets and our public spaces to better support neurodiverse New Yorkers. So how can we think about designing our streets, designing our public spaces to support mental health, um, to expand public infrastructure, things like water and power, um, and to even think about the, one of the longstanding um, issues in New York of public restrooms. Uh, and then finally, um, our continuity group, and I'm excited to share more of these ideas with you all soon, but um, really how do we, how can all of the work that we're doing with our streets support our community led visions for those places? Um, and, and critically, you know, how can we build a network of our corridors and, and Emily pointed to so much of this great work too of that can serve different uses, right? Some for community uses, micro mobility uses, cultural uses. Um, that we really have an opportunity to um, define our streets differently based on um, what we want to use them for. So again, more than anything, this is a this will be a platform as, that is a hopeful provocation. So um, stay tuned for more soon and would love to keep in touch, but I'm really looking forward to the conversation today. Thank you. Thank you, Martha, very much for covering such a range of things, both not only retrospective, but projective coming out in the in the near future. Um, the, the last panelist today is Daphne Lundy, who is the Deputy Director uh, for Social Resiliency at the Mayor's Office of Climate and Environmental Justice, with a particular focus on climate change and heat risk. Daphne previously served in the Office of Resiliency since 2018 and the Department of City Planning for five years prior. Uh, she is a graduate of Wellesley College and the University of Texas at Austin. And please join with me in welcoming Daphne to Parsons and uh, at the New School. Thanks, David. And good evening, everybody. Really excited to be part of this conversation. Um, I think Martha's uh, presentation actually teed up a lot of what I was gonna cover, but I can add a little bit more, um, I guess, flavor from the perspective of um, MOCEJ. Um, so I guess one point of, of clarity is that um, under this new administration, the Office of Resiliency was actually combined with a number of different offices to, to now form the Office of Environmental and uh, the Office of Climate and Environmental Justice. Um, and, I, and I say this all to say that um, I think a lot of the work that we're doing is, is sort of working at this intersection of, of connectivity and looking for opportunities to be advancing both our climate adaptation priorities as well as our adaptation um, priorities, as well as you know, thinking about climate equity and, and advancing um, programming or policies for people who have historically been marginalized or left out of investments um, in the past. Um, I think when it comes to streets, we are um, uh, blessed with the fact that it covers a lot of our, of, our, of our built environment, but we're also challenged with the fact that we're trying to accomplish a lot of goals um, in a small amount of space. So from the perspective of extreme heat, it's, it's, it's oftentimes thinking about where we can be advancing um, and building out our, our city's tree canopy. It's also looking for places that we can be trying to integrate more um, you know, permeable pavement or other types of interventions as a way to address um, extreme precipitation. Um, it's looking for opportunities to um, sort of 
build spaces of social cohesion. So thinking about, you know, open streets and, and what they met during the pandemic, you know, where you could sort of leave your home and, and meet people. Um, that's a really big uh, part of social resiliency. Um, it's, it's thinking about how we're sort of modernizing our infrastructure to allow for things like, um, you know, e-charging, whether it's uh, for vehicles or for bikes. Um, so that's a lot of the, the, the work that we, we do in the office. And I'll say that a, a big part of the, the focus is thinking about how through investments we're trying to uh, address you know, these histories of harms or these histories of, of disinvestment. So when it comes to extreme heat, a lot of the places in the city that face greatest um, vulnerability are the same places where through redlining and other policies, black and brown neighborhoods didn't have trees, had poor housing stock, um, weren't invested in. And so as we think about ways to increase and improve green infrastructure, it's also beginning to do the reparative work of investing in places that weren't invested in before. Um, and then during the pandemic, a lot of the traditional modes we had um, especially when it came to extreme heat had to be reimagined. So, you know, it was it was hard to use traditional cooling centers. So we did things like, um, you know, provide uh, air conditioning to people at home, but we also encouraged where possible outdoor cooling, whether it was through open streets, cool streets, or um, through the city's uh, Cool It NYC map, which was showing um, the location of water features, water fountains, et cetera. So, you know, I think that, um, in, in just like thinking about the role of streets, we, we see it as, as a place where we can accomplish a lot of our goals around resiliency and sustainability. And it's also a place where we can, again, be um, working to invest and, um, you know, repair just past wrongdoings when it comes to, you know, how black and brown communities have, have not been invested in. Um, and I think that that thinking is uh, integrated in a lot of our, our initiatives. So, you know, currently the city is working on the environmental justice for all plan. And a big part of what that plan is going to do is um, spatially understand where investments have or have not been made, um, spatially understand, um, you know, what infrastructures have either helped address or um, possibly put pressures when it comes to environmental justice. And in using that, that's another tool that um, you know, we can then use in our capital planning process or in our programming process. Um, I say this all as a non-capital agency, so a lot of what we do is always in partnership. So it's in partnership with folks like in the Parks Department and DOT in, and DEP and, and um, you know, the folks that are really uh, building um, the, the, the projects that, you know, improve our streetscapes and improve our city. Um, and I'll leave it at that for now. Stephanie, thank you very much. And I think one of the things that you're bringing up is that there, there are very different ways to look at this question. You know, the seemingly, seemingly in some ways prosaic nature of, of a street that forms a city. And so I want, I want to lead with a kind of um, uh, what may seem to be a slightly obvious question, but I think it's worth foregrounding, particularly at the time in which, you know, a number of people are simply looking to move on from pandemic, literally to turn it into a historical condition. Uh, the the question of of, of the of the biology notwithstanding, um, and and ask each of you to to present one thing that you have learned from the last two years, from the process of the accelerated almost uh, n by necessity of of uh, of the time to implement something that was that was rapidly deployed, but now should be carried on in perpetuity. In other words, and this can be either a thing, a design, a decision, a process, or even a concept. In other words, how has the accelerated nature of addressing a pandemic actually reframed a conception of the street that could not have been done before, but should not be lost in the uh, in a post-pandemic condition and if i could start by asking going down in the same order asking emily uh to speak about this first and then go go through each just as say you know what is the one thing you would not want to lose in this that has come out of this condition 
it's a great uh, and very challenging question to answer um, so singularly, just because mm -hmm. so much of um, there there have been so many lessons, kind of large and small, um, in in the work that um, I've done over the course of the pandemic. Um, I mean, I think I think one thing, and again. Um, It's a little bit of a um, a lesson of of enforcement um, is that it's like or reinforcement rather is that um, the pandemic has has reinforced um, for me and again just going back to this this feedback loop concept um, that we we need to adapt and iterate you know we cannot think about anything kind of certainly on our streets but in the public realm and and with public life as something that is static and so open restaurants is such a great example of something that was such um such a lifesaver, such a lifeline for so many restaurants. But if it continues to exist in its current form, um, you know, it's it's facing self-destruction um, because there are all these other challenges that we need to keep iterating and need to keep changing and being responsive to and helping to solve the sanitation issues, helping to solve the emergency access issues, the seasonality issues, the the lack of, of permeable uh, curb line, um, the, the need for uh, regular loading and delivery and all, all the other types of access needs that our, street, um, that our streets are, are really um, dependent on. Um, so yeah, so I would say it's this, it, it really is uh, reinforcing the need for us um, in, in cities, but also in, in communities to kind of constantly adapt. And that iteration um, is an asset and it keeps, um, it keeps uh, the work that we do relevant. It, it, it's a really, because what you're basically arguing is that the design process of design, that doesn't say we will get it right the first time, but actually a process of constantly proposing, addressing the moment, resetting, re-examining, redoing it again, that that process is critical to the constant transformation of the city that may have been accelerated, but one that actually foregrounds that as a necessary public role of, of, of integration and design. Fauzia, can you, can you you know build upon that? In other words, what would you point to as the thing that has come out that you would really, that you want to pinpoint as something that you're continuing or wanting to continue? Um, I think just sort of to feed off what Emily said in terms of iterative processes, um, there was something that really was remarkable that happened during the pandemic, which was, you know, say me and my cohorts and design advocates who run small firms mostly or work in small firms. There was this level of collaboration and sort of open channels that we had never experienced with city agencies because everyone was trying to figure out how to get this right and things were changing on a daily basis. Um, and so we were, you know, I was on a call with Emily, who I had never met before in my 10 years of practice in the city. And, um, and that's how I met Martha also was because we started working on open restaurants with Neighborhoods Now. And so there was, there was this level of camaraderie, collaboration, and a lack of competition, which often exists in our industry. Um, that occurred and and if if we could continue to have that sort of channel be open and continue to sort of collaborate and advise each other on what we're seeing in the field versus like what's going to work from a code enforcement i i think that there is a way to continue these programs and to do it successfully and to do it in an equitable way no without, without question i think this is one of the Key things because you were also addressing a very clear challenge, which was coming to some extent externally as is in a, a, a virus. So Martha, what's your sense? Yeah, I think, I mean, I'm really loving what Emily and Fosia mentioned, and I feel like stewarding um, the Neighborhoods Now program when I did too, I really witnessed that as well, just the ways that um, we were flexible in a way that we weren't before the pandemic that I think was really powerful. But I think I think building on that as well, I think the pandemic really 
broke open our imagination for what we can do with fewer cars and that the dominance of car culture I think I hadn't even fully realized how strongly it was ingrained in just my understanding of our city and our country um, but just seeing what is possible for our streets as spaces for community um, I feel like we can't go back from that now um, and and I think in particular, we saw that, you know, all, you know, all New Yorkers deserve access to public space, deserve access to fresh air, and that streets really can be those spaces. I'm thinking about um, the Black Lives Matter mural in bed and the ways that um, we, that streets just became spaces for community connection. They became our front doors and our living rooms. And, um, I just think that that has to stick with us as a core principle as we think about um, recognizing that, you know, there will continue to be some need for some cars in the city right now, but how can we, how can we really start to keep that, that feeling of flexibility, that feeling of something different is possible um, and not just go back to um, everything is the same as it was before, because uh, I don't think we can go back there. The, in many ways, the very reconception of the of the street as a subject for discussion is mm -hmm. is foregrounded. Um, mm -hmm. that we have to iterate on it and have to understand it in terms of a shared shared set of values. Yeah. Daphne, how would you approach that question? Yeah, I mean, I I think I'd echo a lot of what's been said. There was just a a level of breaking down of silos, of just clearing of bureaucracies that made a lot of things that weren't possible or, or took a long time happen in a truncated uh, period of amount of time. Um, I think that, you know, per Emily's point, there's still the need for the space of, of reiteration, revisiting, not just sort of having a, a thing be uh, embedded in stone, but I think we were able to just like see what was possible um, when we we had no choice but to make new things possible. Um, I think the other thing that really struck me was how community groups, you know, with supports of like folks like Fazia, with folk, um, support of programs like Neighborhood Now, were able to program their streets in ways that weren't, you know, possibly, um, potentially possible before. Um, just the ways that a lot of uh, CBOs, particularly CBOs that, don't have, um, you know, more space beyond sort of their four walls or able to sort of exit those four walls and, and go into the streets in a way, whether it was programming or um, activations and, and what, it, what it means when more um, CBOs have those options. So like that, that's something that was really uh, remarkable to me, particularly in places in the city where there, there aren't um, as many parks, like seeing how CBOs are able to um, you know, participate in open streets, art programming, or other types of programming to, to sort of make those new open spaces um, that didn't exist beforehand. Um, I, I guess on the, on the as, as part of that, I, I'm also just like struck by um, the amount of, of labor <laughs> that went into all of this, like, I'm especially thinking about the, the, the amazing pro bono work that I know a lot of design, um, that a lot of folks in design communities have uh, provided. I, I know a lot of the pro bono work that CBOs provided, sort of going above and beyond their um, the scope of, of what they do as a CBO. So I, I think I'm, I'm just like struck by the, the need and, and the mandate to figure out ways to better support folks um, doing that type of community facing work in the future. Um, David, I'm going to jump in and, and play co-moderator for a minute and first of all just thank uh, all of the panelists for um, extraordinary work and um, and and for the conversation that we're in the midst of and and Daphne I want to just stay with you maybe I'll I'll go backwards on the on the list um, but uh, stay with the with the mayor's office of climate and environmental justice and uh, and thank you for starting where you did in your presentation because it's not just a semantic change I think it's really a a very important change, as you've said, um, in the reorganization of the mayor's office and what it signals uh, for the city. And, um, and you know, in full disclosure, 
it's the group that I work most with as my role as the co-chair of New York City Panel on Climate Change. So we um, uh, sort of, you know, um, and I, I know you folks well, and I, I think there's an amazing work that happens out of that office. Um, I, I wanted to stay with you uh, and this question that David asked about what we have to make sure not to lose. Um, because one of, the, one of the things that's been made so abundantly clear in the reusing of our streets through all of the work that's been presented tonight and, and, um, and other projects that have gone on is the degree to which our streets were never intended for cars. Right, so the last time we thought about our streets was in 1811, when the commissioner's plan laid out the grid for New York City, and there were no cars. It, wa it wasn't laid out for cars. It wasn't sized for cars. We just parked them there. We stored them there, and um, and we've just we we come over decades, centuries to accept the street as a space for cars. And in the pandemic that accepting that no longer was an option. It, it finally kind of was dislodged. And I, I'm hearing that from all of you. And so I wanna go Daphne to you and say, there are other things that it seems to me that are also no longer acceptable, if you will, in our current world. And I wanna start with climate and ask you if you were to, as you rethink the city from the perspective of a, of a um, non-capital <laughs> um, agency. Um, what are the kinds of information and data and um, uh, the engagement with communities around these large scale questions that our streets are so connected to that you think need to be coming out of this work, out of, these, out of this crisis of the pandemic that has dislodged um, our imagination in a way to start to see the city streets as an entirely new resource. Um, one that in a, in a lot of ways was left over as, as the blocks were designed for capital speculation and the streets were the leftover space and it's now become inverted. So I'm, I'm really curious to think at the broad system scale because a lot of the work we've discussed so far is in, our, in it's more fragmented. So if you think from the, from the systems level, where do you see this going from the mayor's office and then, um, uh, and then follow this through with the rest of the panelists? Yeah, I think that, I think it goes back to my, um, sort of the original uh, point I made in, in opening this, just the fact that, you know, we are a city with a finite amount of, of, of buildings like land, like we, we, we are sort of like bounded in a way. And because of that, we need to be really strategic in terms of how we're spending our, our money and how we're sort of trying to embed um, an understanding of, climate change, understanding of, of environmental justice in, in all projects. So I think a really good example of, of how we've been doing that most recently has been through the climate resiliency design guidelines. Um, for, you know, for folks who aren't aware, there were a couple of local laws that were passed um, pre-pandemic. And what it basically did was it had um, certain mandates that um, certain types of capital projects would have to account for things like sea level rise, extreme heat, uh, extreme precipitation, and flooding in the in the building out and scoping of the project. So it's 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 a type of um, initiative that's supposed to sort of touch all types of projects. So not just buildings, but also things like streets, street ends, et cetera. And what's really critical now is that it's gone from being these sets of guidelines to being things that are now mandated. So, you know, once we're out of this pilot process um, in the next couple of years, it's gonna be something that um, sort of any, any type of agency grappling with a capital project has to consider. And I think that's, that's, that's kind of the place that we're operating in now. How are we, 
just given the complexity of, of capital projects, given the complexity of the city, how are we embedding a fundamental understanding of climate risk and an understanding of environmental justice in projects um, that we make? And I think part of why, why it's important is because you know, we're, we're not a new city, so we're always in this place of having to sort of retrofit and try to upgrade as much as we can. But when we do have the opportunities to make or, or build out new projects, how are we doing it in a way that is um, equitable from, you know, the, the spatial location of certain projects? How are we making sure that these projects are being built out in a way that, um, you know, considers future projections of climate change? So, so that's kind of the thinking um, that, you know, we are trying to advance in a lot of the policies and legislations that we put forth. So it's it's something that we we want to advance for streets, but it's something that we're trying to advance in all projects across the city because it's 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 work that needs to happen across all types of capital projects, all types of projects, regardless. And and um, it's super Daphne and exactly the kinds of things I was um, hoping to hear in response. And I'm curious, Martha, if I if I do it backwards, right? Um, you're next, and the um, the in a way, your presentation was kind of almost like a set of criteria for a new commissioner's plan. Like I, I list, you went through all of those things. I'm thinking, yeah, if you redrew that plan from a systems level, it would be based on those criteria. Yeah, yeah, that's an interesting way to think about it. I think we're we're definitely. Um, considering ways that this, um, how we can work with this administration for, for this work to come to life. I think, um, I think one thing that comes to mind for me in particular that feels really present um, in the way that we're talking about our streets right now is the question of safety um, and the ways that like we're seeing record levels of um, traffic violence on our streets. And I think this is really a present present issue for our administration and a present issue for New Yorkers. Um, and something that I'm excited about just in thinking about how we can connect um, this real, real present issue with um, the other real and present issue of the climate crisis that Daphne was talking about is thinking about how we can actually expand our definition of safety um, beyond just safety from traffic violence to um, so that New Yorkers are also safe from extreme heat, safe from flooding due to storm surges and the ways that um, when we're thinking about safety on our streets, we're actually thinking really comprehensively about that. So um, that came up for me as, as, um, as Daphne was speaking in terms of how we can really be translating you know, some of these big picture agenda items into um, things that we can do on the street and things that we can do on the street for our climate as well. Um, and one, one other thing I just wanted to, to mention, Joel, as you, you know, were thinking about this kind of networked question, networked approach, um, I'm really excited about the, um, the bike boulevards work that DOT is doing and things like the, um, the Broadway vision plan, I think really kind of think about our streets as, as spines that are connecting our neighborhoods um, and that are connecting um, uh, different parts of our city. And I think that that's actually um, a really important way for us to be thinking about our streets um, as a whole as we go forward. Is how can we be thinking about spines that connect um, and how can we really be, be networking um, to connect our city? So those, those were a couple of things that came up for me. But um, uh, as you mentioned, I think really, uh, really interested and excited to, to think about those grounding seas, the kind of commerce, culture, climate, care, continuity as. Um, as values for our streets, right? And, and as values that hopefully um, really align with what, what our administration is thinking about and already thinking about um, in work like what Daphne's doing and others. Amazing. And, and Fauzia, does, um, does that trigger thoughts for this kind of, uh, the kind of collaborative um, network, if you will, uh, that Martha was just talking about and that you were, you were sort of, um, Highlighting is something you don't want to lose, the collaborative nature, the non-competitive nature of what came out of this um, period. And I'm, I'm curious if, if it suggests you forms of practice that are more um, networked and engaged in this way. Yeah, I think, I think there's a couple things here. One is sort of thinking about, you know, 
the residents of New York City and and sort of understanding, which I think came to light, um, you know, after after the events of the summer of 2020, whether it was George Floyd or whether it was COVID, but um, the idea that there isn't a one size fits all resolution for all of New York City. And I think that applies to street use as well. You know, in, in a lot of the neighborhoods that where we were working um, initially doing open restaurants, uh, you know, parking spaces were more important to people in those neighborhoods because their cars are their livelihoods and that's how they get to work. And if they can't find parking when they get home, they have to drive around for two hours, right, to find parking. And so I think part of, part of this is that the process needs to change and how do we sort of incorporate all of those voices, the people who want social spaces and want places for their kids to run out into the street, but then the people who are sort of like, I gotta have a car and I've gotta go to work in the morning and then I've gotta come home and find a place to park that car. And, and I, I think it's, it's sort of shifting some of the power and the agency to people, right? And, and I think we as designers can sort of be agents for them in, in bringing those thoughts and those ideas and those needs, um, you know, as sort of a conduit to city agencies. And, and, and just the last uh, piece of this uh, broad systems question, Emily representing the capital agency on the panel. Um, what, um, I mean, it's really interesting to think about how this question that, that Fauzia puts forward of um, reconciling the kind of world we live in, like that we've come to, and these very critical transformative future questions of climate, of networks, of spines, of um, heat and cooling in the city that sit, the streets can play such an important role. And how, what, you know, wither DOT in that space? <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think um, we inherently are, you know, as a transportation agency, we're inherently thinking kind of at the, um, you know, um, about systems and kind of at the, the network scale. Um, I mean, I, I would just layer onto this, I think, um, you know, you mentioned the, the commissioner's plan, which um, obviously had a, had a big impact on Manhattan, but there are certainly plenty of other big uh, impacts um, and thoughts about our streets, um, you know, Robert Moses and kind of, you know, ripping up and um, creating these, these highways and parkways um, and, you know, many of which, um, you know, really disenfranchise uh, uh, certain communities to this day. And I think um, that was also, um, you know, another huge, and, and a few folks have mentioned this, but I think Another huge confluence of the pandemic was both um, the need for outdoor space, kind of um, mixed with, um, you know, a huge um, uh, social justice movement that I think, um, you know, just continued to, to push the fact that, um, just like we saw in COVID, but also like we see with so many of our systems, kind of continue to disenfranchise um, communities of, of color. And I think from a systems perspective and a real whole scale change of our streets perspective, we do need to be thinking about um, the freight uh, component of, of our streets. 90% um, of our goods are still delivered by truck to New York City. Um, and there are many uh, highways and uh, emissions that that roll through um, communities of colors uh, who you know also don't have um, uh, the best access to mass transit and other options of of transportation. So um, you know a huge part of our work and kind of set forth in, in the streets plan is also really trying to continue to, um, to pivot and, and put focus and, and priority on um, 
on neighborhoods and, and street improvements um, where there's been um, a, a lack of investment um, to you know, very, very serious and, and long-term consequences. Um, and I think uh, you know, that, um, can I get just going back to, to David's question um, to begin with, I think like my kind of second answer to that would be um, you know, something that has changed over the course of the pandemic that I don't think we can go back to um, is the decentralization. Um, and I think we're very excited and, and are seeing that in, um, in DOT's uh, Earth Day events, uh, which we'll be celebrating on Saturday, where um, you know, it, it had historically been along Broadway and up a little bit in Washington Heights. And this year we are really um, spreading um, events and, and su substantial uh, car-free programming across all five boroughs. Um, that has been, I think, a huge success of open streets and one we need to continue to work on and build upon is, um, you know, how we both create programs where, you know, you don't have to go uh, into Manhattan Park Avenue on a summer, uh, you know, August uh, Saturday at 7 a.m. to experience a, a car-free street with all of these activities, but um, we can have those types of incredibly uh, diverse and vibrant and, and high quality car-free programming in neighborhoods all, all across the city. Um, and I think for us, you know, uh, kind of the, the two um, kind of big focuses there are one, again, as I said before, how do we continue to, to amplify um, inputs of participation? How do we keep um, making sure that uh, uh, folks can participate in, in this process and shape their streets? Um, but also, you know, how do we continue to keep uh, the bar and, and barriers to entry low? Um, so that communities can can iterate and, you know, we're going to um, we, we see a lot of these programs are, you know, again, a, along along Broadway kind of through the, the core of um, uh, central business and, and Manhattan neighborhoods, um, all these types of improvements while challenging and, and folks still defend every last parking space, um, you know, we can make a lot of a lot of gains there. Um, in some other neighborhoods and other communities, the challenges are just so much greater. Um, so how do we really continue to focus resources um, you know, and, and move at a pace um, where we're kind of maximizing uh, participation um, and, and again, relevance that, that um, you know, these improvements are not just kind of, um, uh, I think, um, Someone said, you know, not a one size fits all, um, but really catered towards um, towards communities um, and, and what they need. It, it takes a pandemic to dislodge Robert Moses and the commissioner's plan. Um, so, uh, David, I don't know, should we open this up to questions from the audience? Yeah, yeah, without question. So if you have, well, if you have a question, you can either raise your hand uh, using the reactions or put it in the chat. Um, and, and as we wait, I'm, I think one, one of the things I'm really struck by is the way in which the, the external threat of, of COVID produced a reconceptualization of something one takes for granted. But also to Fazio's point, I think this is really instructive, changed the way in which one collaborated because the collaboration was necessitated because of something that's seemingly external and had a kind of immediacy to it. I but, but what Daphne is also arguing here is that this is continuing through the question, not only of climate, but of justice, so of, of social justice and equity. And that, that at, that's one way to focus a reconceptualization, but it also raises the issue of what in your experience, this is sort of an open question, are the biggest challenges in terms of opposing conditions? Is it different factions or groups? Or would you say it's different conceptualizations of the shared resource of the street that are lodged into those different? Because this is not a kind of neutral territory where everyone's agreeing that this is all should be the same. This is a highly contested piece. There is a shared willingness because of the immediacy. But as we continue forward, how does one maintain that? And what are the primary challenges? Is it, is it individuals or is it the conception?
And we don't have to answer that. We just leave that as a kind of floater out there to, to because I do think, I w will argue that okay. if, if it's both if you foreground the question of climate as a, con a continuation of a challenge and the question of, of equity as a fundamental right, then it continues that collective necessity of working that is in, it's essential through a design iterative process to make that change that is also listening and responding. Mickey, do you want to do you want to uh, you have your hand up? It looks like you're still muted. Or you're just waving. It's one of the Not sure if you have a question or if anybody wants to respond to that to that question of whether or not it's a conceptualization or whether there are or well, let's put it this way what do you see as the biggest challenge between the different groups david i i think i'm unmuted now ah great i was not permitted to unmute myself thank you ah, so much i perfect. have a question that's more of a middle range question than the one that you've raised perfect. but i wanted to address it to emily and to Fazia. Um, my question concerns equity for the people who live on 34th Avenue in Queens. And I was delighted to hear Fazia talk about the kind of ethnographic engagement she had with communities there and that her teams had with communities there. And my question for Emily is, as a representative of the DOT, a capital agency, what kind of engagement went on before 26 blocks in Queens, which in a residential area where at least 10,000 people are living on those blocks. Um, what kind of engagement was done with people with mobility impairments in that neighborhood? Because we hear from our community members and community members all around Queens and also throughout the city that mobility access, access ride, access for people who have uh, a need for automobile transportation that's really legitimate, um, not that all needs for automobile transportation might not be legitimate, but people who are, who are in a disadvantaged community, a community that has been long discriminated against, um, are experiencing new discrimination via the Department of Transportation. So I wanted to ask that question, and I would ask it this way. Could Fazia tell Emily what Emily might do, and could Emily explain what was done by the Department of Transportation? That's what I'd really love to hear. Thank you. Um, I, I guess what I would say is that Emily should engage agencies and groups like Design Advocates to help them sort of do these um, engagement processes with these communities to determine, you know, whether they actually want open streets or not. You know, we can we can sort of speculate over data and doing field observations, but it's not until we actually start to talk to the people who live there as to find out whether they actually want these streets. And and even in neighborhoods now, and David was part of our group, you know, there we tried to do an open street at one point and and the neighborhood just sort of said no like we can't you know the the business owners sort of said we have to have our deliveries in the morning like otherwise we won't survive and so you know that engagement process should be step number one i would say yeah absolutely um no thanks for that um I completely agree. Um, and thanks for that question, Mickey. It's a really good one. Um, DOT for many years has had um, a, a focus on um, and, and a head of um, accessibility and really thinking about how our street designs kind of ranging from um, open streets uh, all the way through to our shared streets and plaza spaces, um, how we can uh, make sure that all of these streets designs are, are equitable and inclusive um, to people of varying ages and varying abilities. Um, we are kind of still in the middle of a really robust process um, with the visually impaired community about our shared streets and how we um, kind of develop standards um, amidst the, again, the kind of broad range of um, of communities, um, the, the community with um, visual impairments. 
Um, open streets for us um, and, and accessibility is key, um, a huge part. Uh, and, and what has been our mantra over the last year has been moving beyond the barricade and actually using some of our more robust street design tools uh, to design these spaces, ways to divert vehicles. So we're kind of slowing um, and limiting overall volumes um, to make the streets still limited local access. Um, but again, to design uh, shared streets and use other types of treatments, um, traffic calming elements, um, chicanes, uh, hugs, uh, um, as we call them and ha have designed on Willoughby, all to um, you know, really balance how vehicles um, and, and drivers use the street with all the other um, range and, and users of our street. So again, it's still very much an ongoing process, um, but with 34th Avenue, um, we've done a lot of surveys um, from the public, but also are, are looking at and discussing open streets as a program with a larger set of accessibility advocates across the city um, and something um, you know, we continue to uh, take very seriously um, and are, are integrating into our, our designs. I just want to point to there's an interesting comment in the chat from Joyce Chan who talking about the key role that a community can play um, just to understand that this is a, a multifaceted condition. I mean, in some ways, the the conversation can begin with a very simple thing of what should the 10 foot by 20 foot parking space be used as, but ultimately it starts becoming much more about a question of of what constitutes public, what constitutes public process to Tess Harrods, this question and to uh, Joyce's, because the, the issue that you're all working with at different levels is how do we not only think about public process, but actually how is, I would argue, how is the, des the design of that process, the conceptualization of that process tied to an understanding of the way in which we design, to Joel's point, of this street from the beginning. In other words, uh, this is a, in a school of design, but it's not designed as something that's outside of process. It's in very much the way in which one conceptualizes change. Um, and to what, to what extent are you in your work, and this is, uh, Daphne, maybe I'll put this to you, thinking about the public process as a design condition. In other words, something where there is a, there is a proposal put forward there is an examination of it, and there's a willingness to transform it, to see it as, a, as either an iterative process or one in which in order to necessitate feedback, one, one has to put forward change, as we've seen in the last few years, and get the response back that comes from that back and forth, as opposed to policy, which is often seen as a, a debate and a decision and a completion, right? That's a good question. Um, I guess I don't know if I see it as like a as an either or in part because a lot of the engagement that we do for projects is not it's not just us doing it. It's us doing it with, um, you know, people like the Parks Department, people like DCP, people who are working at that um, at that neighborhood scale or that that closer scale than than we might be from like a policy perspective. So I don't know if it's if if it is that that cut and dry. I think oftentimes because we're working so closely with other agencies, we are able to get part of that feedback in terms of, you know, what people are hearing at certain meetings or or sort of what um, yeah, what concerns are being raised. Um, uh, with certain projects. I will say like one of the challenges that we do face is that, um, you know, for projects that are being led by um, federal entities or entities outside of the city, we're often in the place of trying to advocate for more robust engagement or more, um, um, more sort of uh, specialized engagement to like the New York City context. So a really good um, recent uh, example of that 
that the Army Corps of Engineers has been doing on the harbor and tributary study, basically looking at the 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 long the long explanation. The long story short of that is like looking for um, you know opportunities to study coastal protection for the city. So this is a this is a federal entity that you know is coming into the into the city, doing that analysis, trying to sort of figure out you know what potential strategies and pathways are, but they're not as connected um, to sort of like local conditions or to um, uh, certain community issues or challenges or, or concerns around projects. So um, in the case of that study, a lot of what we've been doing is a, just making sure that as um, they are considering engagement uh, processes, they're connected to the right people and they know sort of the right folks to talk about um, and talk to with that process. Um, but even in that case, it's still this existing um, you know, federal process that we're trying to make work for us better as a city, work for us better as, as residents. So I can't say that it's always perfect, but whenever we have that sort of interface to talk to people doing the engagement work or to talk to um, people who are um, closer to the ground. I think that's what we're trying to use to sort of shape our policy or, or, or shape what we're trying to put forth. It's not, it's not like a um, two separate things. It's it's more often than not like this this feedback loop that happens. David, I was just going to, I was going to follow that um, with a, a comment on the climate knowledge exchange, Daphne, which is coming out of the mayor's office as well, which is, I think, an example of that kind of local work, trying to really um, hear and share information um, to be able to sort of establish where are the gaps in the knowledge that you need to know in order to make the sorts of design decisions. So I, I love Mickey's question because in a sense it says, what are the criteria that you would then design to, right? And so, and of course, obviously safety and access, those are things we think about all the time. Um, but I suspect if you started with those criteria, you wouldn't end up with the streets that we have today. Um, there are lots of ways for us to design access, design um, uh, consideration for, for individuals who need particular attention and, with the, and the streets would be safer as a result. You know, it's, it's, we're kind of doing these workarounds based on uh, other conditions. So I'm, I'm fascinated by um, the conversation because it's so dislodging. And, and situating the possibility for design right now, it's, a, it's really, it's, it's wonderful. Fazia, can I ask you to expand upon what the comment you said about the streets would look different across the city? Yeah, you know, if we were, it's back to the one size doesn't fit all idea, right? Like different neighborhoods, different communities have different needs and, and their street needs are inevitably related to that. And, um, and so I, I can imagine, you know, what that might start to look like. It's, it's like having many cities or many communities or many sort of systems throughout the city that, you know, they do all connect, but once you get to a hub, it, it looks really different. Uh, and that could be really interesting and, and really representative of the diversity in the city, right? We're, we're coming up on seven o'clock and Emily, if I could ask you to, to, uh, to address a particular question that's, a, that's in the chat having to do with this interplay between the temporary shed and the designed permanent piece is the work that you're working on in terms of transforming what was a temporary piece into more, more of a, you know, how does this then become part of what the, the, the more permanent open restaurants that you're working on and how you're playing some of these very challenges that are looking at between design of permanency versus temporary versus public access and the conception of the street? Yeah, definitely. Um, uh, the open restaurant uh, saga continues um, as we, uh, you know, continue to work towards uh, a permanent program. But I think the overall, the overall spirit of the moving um, of the program moving forward is to think about um, our streets as 
uh, a more, more flexible. So the program itself is permanent, um, allowing restaurants to apply to use streets and sidewalks um, for, for outdoor dining. That process is permanent, um, but the actual design of our streets, you know, we still need to be able to, to repave our streets, to design more bike lanes and uh, shared streets and plazas and bus lanes and do all the things that we need to do um, kind of as a, as a transportation agency. And I think everybody agrees it doesn't make sense to, to throw off um, a major transportation project for one individual restaurant. Um, so I think thinking about, um, you know, a, a seasonal, a seasonality to, um, to outdoor dining in the streets, whereas the sidewalk being a place where you could have maybe more um, full-time full -time outdoor dining. Um, but again, still really trying to preserve sidewalks for all of the access and circulation and, and other key, um, you know, curb access uh, type needs that we need. It's like, a, um, uh, you know, our, our streets are, are, you know, and I, I'm very biased, but, um, you know, I think uh, one of our most valuable um, pieces of infrastructure, um, and, and they are truly uh, very democratic. And so some, you know, something we, we all need to share and we need to figure out, um, yeah, the, what are the right balances given, given so many demands on this really, really valuable space. As well, as well as be engaged in the process of talking, imagining, reconceptualizing, and working collectively to um, imagine and design and implement the, the future street. So, I don't know if there are any closing comments that anyone would like to make. I'll leave it as a kind of open moment. Given the complexity of everything at, at hand, um, Maybe the, the, the you know I'll, I'll I'll close by thanking uh, the panelists, thanking Emily, uh, thanking Fazia, thanking Martha, and thanking Daphne as well as to thank Joel for co-moderating this panel. And I, I just want to foreground or sort of end with a kind of a call to continue the kind of discussion because I think this is one of the real benefits of this is to be able to hear the diverse perspectives and and perceive the challenges from a different different standpoint that is absolutely critical in the building of collective shared public space. And thank you for all your work, continue work for it. This is being recorded and will be shared out. So thank you all. And, and thank you, David, for, for pulling so much of this together and Mike as well. Um, yeah. Really appreciate both of you as well. Yeah, especially to Mike. So thank you all and have a really great night and go out for dinner at an open restaurant.